Welcome everyone. I'm Kara Griffith, the President and CEO of Tax Analysts. I'm so pleased that you've joined us for what I know will be a very interesting discussion on the need for and the challenges of reforming tax expenditures. And we have put together a wonderful panel that is ready to tackle the issues. Today's event is the eighth in Tax Analyst series of public discussions we call Taxing Issues. We launched this series as part of our 50th anniversary celebration. And through it, we are bringing the tax community together with leading policymakers and experts for bipartisan discussions on the future of tax policy. While I'm increasingly hopeful that we will be able to hold in-person events in the not too distant future, with COVID-19 still threatening the health of Americans from coast to coast, we will continue to host these discussions in a virtual format. And we welcome your feedback on how we can make them more interactive. We also welcome your suggestions on future webinar topics. You can send any feedback or suggestions to events at taxanalyst.org. And now onto the topic at hand. Tax expenditures are the deductions, credits, and other preferences that are scattered throughout the tax code. Governments all around the world use them generously to promote public policy objectives, like home ownership or saving or investments. But from a budget perspective, tax expenditures are very expensive in terms of lost government revenue. In fact, our federal government foregoes well over $1 trillion in revenue every year because of tax expenditures. Tax expenditure reform has been hotly debated, but has remained elusive over the year, despite their cost, the fact that they often don't achieve their desired policy goals, and that sometimes those goals could be achieved by other means. Tax expenditures also tend to benefit higher income taxpayers, largely because those taxpayers are in higher tax brackets. While tax expenditures can't be put into a single bucket and declared bad, there's certainly room for improvement. So why has reform been so hard to achieve? The idea of broadening the base, which means eliminating tax expenditures or at least scaling them back and lowering rates has long been viewed as good tax policy. A discussion of tax expenditure reform is likely to get to gather steam in the near future as federal policymakers seek to raise revenue to pay for lots of additional spending. President Biden's executive order on distributional fairness of programs and an increased focus on income, wealth, and racial inequalities will further drive that conversation. So to help us sort all of this out, we have an outstanding panel. First, we have Tom Newbig, who is instrumental in conceiving of this panel, and I want to thank him and the Council on Economic Policies, where Tom is a senior associate, for helping to put it together. Tom is also a founding member of TaxSageNetwork.com and a member of Tax Analyst Board of Directors. Previously, he was with the OECD and before that EY. Chai Cheng Huang is the Executive Director of the Tax Law Center at NYU Law. She was previously with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, where she focused on federal tax, fiscal, and economic policy proposals. Chai Cheng is a frequent author on tax and economic policy issues. Jean Sterling, is Institute Fellow and the Richard B. Fisher Chair at the Urban Institute. He's also a co-founder of the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center, the Urban Institute Center on Nonprofits and Philanthropy, and several continuing Urban Institute programs. Last but certainly, certainly not least, Marty Sullivan is Chief Economist and a contributing editor with Tax Analysts. Previously, he served at both the Treasury Department and the Joint Tax Committee. Marty has the admirable ability to explain technical tax topics in a way that makes sense. And I know that our readers and myself greatly appreciate it. Marty is going to set the stage for us and begin the, the discussion among the panelists. The slides he will refer to are available for download directly below the video window on your screen. At the outset, I noted that we welcome your questions. Thank you to those who emailed your questions in advance. Please also use the chat feature to submit questions during today's event. The panelists will have a discussion of the issues, and then I will pose your questions to them, and we will get to as many of them as time permits. And with that, Marty, I turn it over to you. Well, Kara, thank you very, very much. Uh, before we get to our panel of experts, I just want to get some background out of the way for uh, our listeners, our audience who may not be familiar with uh, tax expenditures. So. Um, Laura and Michelle, if we could have the first uh, slide, please. Um, what is a tax expenditure? Well, there's all different definitions, but here's the one 
from the um, 1974 Budget Act. Reve there are revenue provisions attributable to provisions of the federal laws which allow a special exclusion, exemption, or deduction from gross income to provide a special credit, a preferential rate, or, or a tax deferral of liability. Well, what you learn from this is that uh, tax expenditures can take many different forms, credits, deductions, exclusions, etc. But you also learn from this that the word special is in there. And what exactly does that mean? And uh, as with a lot of legislation, it's pretty vague, and uh, that's a little bit of what we'll be talking about today, the criteria that go into defining and identifying tax expenditures. Next slide, please. How, tax expenditures are big, as Kara was telling us. She said over a trillion, she was correct. 1.44 trillion is the total estimate from the US Treasury Department. There's 167 items on the latest tax expenditure budget. Well, how big is 144 trillion? I'm sorry, 1.44 1, 1 trillion? Well, that's 7% of GDP. It's comparable in size to major chunks of our revenue and our expenditures. So this uh, tax expenditures are not a detail, an obscure provision, obscure idea. It's very central to what goes on in tax policy and overall government policy. Next slide, please. This slide's a little hard to read, but let me just give you the executive summary. Uh, this is the, these are regular expenditures in the blue and tax expenditures in the orange. And we're looking at different categories of uh, policy. And you can see, for example, in the third and fourth columns, starting from the left, in the area of commerce and, and transportation, for example, that tax expenditures are the major way that we spend in these areas of policy. So um, it's very important, even if you're not a tax geek, to understand what's going on with, with tax expenditure budget. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, these, uh, these dollar figures are in billions. So we can see that the this is the list of the top 10 tax expenditures. Uh, number one on the list is the deduction for employer provided medical insurance. And that number would be even larger if we included the tax benefits of exempting the uh, of exemption from the payroll tax. Number two on the list are all the retirement provisions, your IRAs, your pension benefits. Number three, capital gains. Number four, uh, the housing benefits in the code and so on down the line. The top 10 provisions account for 78% of the total. The remaining 100 30 or so are the remaining 32%. Next slide, please. This is a little chart that was harder to put together than you might imagine, but it is uh, tax expenditures measured as a percentage of GDP. Now, tax expenditures go up when you create more tax expenditures, and they go down when you repeal them, but they also go up when you increase tax rates, and they go down when you reduce tax rates. And the um, most dramatic uh, change is all the way on the left-hand side, where the Tax Reform Act of 1986 caused a tremendous decline in uh, tax expenditures because of the reduction in the number of tax expenditures and the reduction of the rates. So tax reform reduces uh, tax expenditures. And the next slide, please. This is something we're gonna talk a lot, a lot about today. Uh, as Kara mentioned, many or most tax expenditures are tilted in favor of higher income taxpayers. And this is just a chart from the Tax Policy Center. And over 50, uh, 50 something percent of the benefits go to the top uh, fifth. So we're gonna talk about how, why this is so and what might be done to remedy it. And finally, the last little bit of introduction is the next slide. And this is a picture on your left-hand side of the Ways and Means Committee, and on the right-hand side of the Senate Finance Committee. These are the tax writing committees in Congress. Now, these committees are pretty powerful. They, are in, they have jurisdiction over tax, trade, the public debt, Medicare, and Social Security. Well, that's enough to uh, keep you busy for a few days. But on top of that, because they have the ability to, in effect, do spending through the tax code, they can dabble in any area of, of, uh, of fiscal policy of, of, or any type of policy just by uh, 
engaging in tax expenditures. So that we're going to talk a little bit about the process of how tax expenditures get through Congress. Okay, well, that's my little introduction. And now I want to uh, get to our panel of experts. Let me say, you really couldn't have found a better uh, panel. All three of these folks have written thoughtfully and extensively on the subject of tax expenditures. So uh, yeah, you can, I highly recommend it. But today we're going to get a little preview. So let me just um, start with uh, some simple questions to get the conversation going. So um, let's see here. Loopholes, shelters, subsidies. That's what people sometimes call the tax expenditure budget. Those sound like some pretty bad things that we don't want in the tax law. Uh, so for example, and then if I'm a tax, uh, if I'm trying to raise revenue like Bowles Simpson in 2010, well, I might go to the tax expenditure budget. Or if I'm a tax reformer like Dave Camp in 2013, I might go to the tax expenditure budget and just start picking off items to raise revenue. So my question for the group is, what's wrong with that? Why um, are all tax expenditures bad? Should we discriminate between them or uh, just start cutting away? Gene, you want to uh, opine? Sure, I can jump in here. I, I think the best way to think about the problem we're going to address broadly uh, today is that you have a direct spending budget and you have a tax expending budget. And they operate often in separate compartments. And we're going to discuss a lot of reasons why that creates, creates a problem. However, just as a lot of direct spending items aren't necessarily bad, neither are all tax expenditures bad. And so there's an issue of whether they're fair. There's an issue of whether they're efficient. There's an issue of whether they're being administered by the right agency. By the way, that can apply in reverse. You could apply some of the same criteria to direct spending items. So that's my simple way of, uh, of answering your question, Marty. They're neither good nor bad nor indifferent just by the fact that they're there. With one major exception, I think the budget accounting for tax expenditures as a tax cut is almost always wrong because it leads to the misleading impression that any tax expenditure is a reduction in taxes rather than similar to something that is a direct spending item. But beyond that, I think the question of efficiency, fairness, effectiveness uh, is open to each tax expenditure. Chai Ching, what do you think about uh, the tax expenditure budget? All bad, all good, indifferent? Uh, you've got everything from one end of the spectrum to another, which is why tax is so fun, isn't it? And, and, and the tax expenditure budget. I mean, I can find loopholes and subsidies and shelters and all of the things that deserve the bad connotations that you were talking about. But I can also look to the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit, two of the most effective anti-poverty programs uh, that we have across the entire budget and um, arguably should become even more effective if uh, recent improvements to the CTC and the ITC are made permanent. Um, so, so again, you do really have to look at each, at each one separately while also sort of recognizing as the chart that you showed uh, really sort of underscored that at the moment, overall, despite being able to sort of point to the EITC and CTC, uh, overall, these things are large, expensive, and skewed to the top of the income distribution. Yeah, at the top of that chart was uh, employer-provided medical care, capital gains, uh, and pensions. And I don't need to do a, statist a statistical study to know that that's probably heavily tilted in favor of uh, our high-income taxpayers. Tom, do you have uh, any tax expenditures you like more than others or hate more than others? As, as Gene said, you know, there are some that are, uh, I think, well-designed, but others that uh, really would benefit from increased transparency and evaluation. And that's where the Council on Economic Policies, a Swiss think tank, really appreciates tax analysts uh, hosting this webinar. They're trying to increase uh, the amount of information policy holders have around the world with a new global tax expenditure database. Oh. And although the United States could be viewed as having a best practice in <laughs> terms of providing information about tax expenditures, I think we've got a long way to go oh. in terms of what information is available about the, uh, the tax expenditures. I guess I have written about uh, how tax expenditures 
to paraphrase Rodney Dangerfield, don't get any respect. That uh, you know, after 60 years, they seem to uh, you know, not be taken in, in much importance. There was a 2010 piece of legislation by Sander Levin, the ranking minority member of the Ways and Means Committee, to say that the JCT should evaluate all the tax expenditures. But he said that they should publish the information for the smallest tax expenditures first and only later do it for the largest tax expenditures. So that would take, you know, 17 years if they did 10, 10 a year. Sp spoken like a true former staff uh, person. Uh, I want to get back to the issue of transp transparency and visibility, but let's talk a little bit about the process of the way tax expenditures get enacted. Let me, uh, let's, let me put it this way to you. Supposing you were a, a lobbyist or an advocate for a particular industry and you wanted to get a, a billion dollar subsidy for that industry. I'm sure it's a worthy cause if you were endorsing it. And uh, putting that aside, um, what would you, what do you think would be the pros and cons of trying to get a direct expenditure versus a tax expenditure? Can I subdivide that issue? You want to put on a lobbyist hat for a few minutes? <laughs> So, so I, I would have subdivided that issue, although okay. part of it is if I'm the lobbyist rather than the firm, I might like it if it comes up annually because they're not <laughs> more money lobbying. But let's suppose I really do represent the industry. Uh, what I'd want is the most permanent program possible. And so I'd either want a mandatory direct expenditure, something like Social Security or something. I'd want something that grows automatically. Uh, like many tax expenditures, the, the larger the economy, the more it grows automatically. I don't have to get a new appropriation. Uh, uh, and most tax expenditures are equivalent to mandatory direct expenditures in the sense that they're more permanent. So the main thing I'd want is something, if I'm representing the industry, that's permanent and growing. Okay. So you would want a tax expenditure because it, if, if it was not sunsetting, if it was not sunset. I'd want a tax expenditure more than an appropriation, but I might take a mandatory direct spending as well. Okay. Uh, what about uh, the public perception? I think you mentioned this uh, originally, Gene. The public, how does the public perceive you when you go in and say, I want a billion dollar subsidy? Well, I might be more likely- a billion likely. dollar tax cut. Well, I, I, was, I, was, I was not speaking to the politics of getting it through the process. Yeah. I may be, as you're clearly indicating, I may be much more likely to be able to sell it as a tax cut than as a direct spending item. In fact, I remember debates. I was not participating in them. My colleagues were in Treasury with Larry Summers, and he was often arguing, yes, you're right. You know, probably a direct spending item might be better than a tax cut. But you know what? I can get this subsidy through a tax cut. And I can't get it any other ways. And maybe Chai Ching can jump in with respect to the child credit is one uh, great example there. Well, and just before I move on there, if, I, if, if on um, on a sort of the business side in particular, I think one sort of overlooked potential benefit of going the tax expenditure route is that if I'm if I'm a, a business established enough to be spending a lot of money on lobbyists, uh, I'm probably fine to receive something as a fairly complicated. Uh, deduction or exemption or some other exclusion from profits. Uh, I, I can have I can access the the tax lawyers and accountants that are needed to sort of be able to make my way through those rules, and I probably have enough profit and cash flow that I don't need to worry about having something be made refundable or paid out in advance. So especially for sort of large established businesses. Uh, you know, that, that, that sort of tax route actually potentially has competitive advantages in the sense that smaller competitors, maybe people that are trying to enter the industry and, and undercut uh, your sort of uh, existing advantage may not be able to access the, the expenditure to the same extent. Um, let me talk a little bit more about process. Uh, digging through the uh, wonderful tax notes uh, archives, I found this uh, article from 1984 talking about this fellow from Delaware, a Democrat, uh, Biden is his name. And he said, quote, there is no system for tax expenditures, no equivalent to the authorization process for the appropriation of funds. The Congress does not consider in light of recommendations from the committees with specialized information. They do not consider the programs which are to be financed by tax expenditures nor does it consider the integration of tax expenditures with direct spending. And so he proposed the 
Tax Expenditure Control Act of 1984, uh, which would remove the authority of uh, tax expenditures from the purview of the tax writing committees and put them, uh, 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 require them to be authorized by the uh, relevant uh, substantive committees. He would have them sunset every 10 years and with a review every 10 years. So um, 37 years later, what do you think folks? Uh, is it time for something like this? Maybe President Biden uh, might remember what he proposed 37 years ago. Or you think that's a step in the right direction? Um, Marty, I think it is a step in the right direction in terms of trying to integrate tax expenditures in the housing area, in the commerce area, in international security with the direct spending and other regulations. And so we have a comprehensive overview of that as opposed to doing it piecemeal with tax done by finance and ways and means and and uh, housing done by the housing uh, yeah. committee. So I think there's a real advantage, whether or not you would want to take it away completely from the tax. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure that that is not going to happen. And so I think what we need is you know, a more comprehensive look at how government is intervening in various sectors, be it uh, direct spending, tax expenditures, or, or loan programs, or regulation. You know, uh, what I'm getting from the panel so far is we need to, we can't just mechanically say all expenditure, uh, tax expenditures are good or bad. We need to review them individually. But what would help that review is increased visibility. Right now, you know, the tax expenditure budget is in the back of the budget, you know, which is like, it's, if you even get the printed out copy, it's you know, thicker than the Manhattan telephone book. And then um, the joint committee puts it out and uh, it's pretty obscure as well. And I think while we, we would not want to say, oh, um, oh, everything on here is bad or it should all be scrutinized, we want it to be, it is useful information that should be more widely available. And um, what I'm also hearing is that there should be more review of these to put them on par with direct spending. But let me just ask this question about the, let's say we did have an annual or every five year review of the tax expenditures. And I think I think Karis um, mentioned a little bit of this as well, but what, what criteria would you want to have them evaluated on? What's a good tax expenditure and what's one that's not so good? Well, I'm, actually, I'm going to ask answer the, a, a different question and, and actually sort of go back to, to the, sure. the process point. Um, mm -hmm. While I while I sort of in the back of my head turn on your turn on your other question about mm -hmm. sort of how to how to assess these things, but I, I think the sort of the Biden proposal that you talked the, the sort of the, the the back when Biden proposal that you talked about sort of had a couple of different elements, and I would think of one element as as potentially useful, and the other element as probably not so useful. I think process reforms generally, when, when you sort of think about changing the process around tax expenditures or budgets or, or various other things, the elements of that that increase sort of transparency and awareness of what's going on tend, in my view, to be more valuable and more important and more productive over time than changes that are designed to force lawmakers to do something that they may not want to do anyway. Yeah, yeah. And I think if we look at sort of the history of forcing mechanisms, whether it's 10 year sunsets or super committees or fiscal cliffs or grand rubber hollings, um, the, the track record isn't very good in, in the sense of the sorts of policies that come out of them not necessarily being uh, fit for purpose. So I would tend, you know, in, in the realm of process reforms to be more attracted to the ones that, as, as Tom was talking about, uh, creates better information. And maybe as you were talking about, means that more people read the analytical perspectives on the back of the, <laughs> at the, back of the budget and uh, the joint committee estimates. Um, the other the other piece is, is sort of there is a question of competence about uh, administration of these things where you probably I do think still want tax committee involvement if you do have the IRS ultimately administering some of these programs and there are good reasons for the IRS to administer some of these uh, tax programs these programs as as tax provisions. Uh, you do want oversight and you do want drafting that is responsive to the way that that tax administration works. Um, yeah. 
to actually try to answer your other question, I, I, I do think that the, the sort of the main the main issue is that that these these provisions should be evaluated against the goals that they're trying to achieve, and a lot of these things are trying to achieve different things. Yeah. I think, I think uh, also, uh, and this will get we'll get into this in a minute is. Uh, what is the uh, distributional impact of these of these provisions? And um, looking through the tax notes archives, I, I did see several proposals. Of course, none of them enacted to require the joint committee to uh, publish uh, instant uh, distributional analyses. Now, the joint committee does <laughs> produce distribution and Chai Ching, you, you know where they are. They're in back of the back of the, back <laughs> of the tax expenditure budget. And it's actually one of the most useful pieces of information you can find. But if we had regular review of the distributional impact, that would be a, another bit of information. Marty, okay. I, I, I don't want to completely drop this jurisdictional issue because I, I do think that process reform and jurisdictional issues are crucial to reform just to Chai Ching raised. And I think there's a history here, long history, that I, which I'm going to try to give a 15 second summary, is if you look back early in the history of taxes and spending in this country, most spending was public spending in the broad sense that they weren't individually directed transfers or benefits. There were things like public goods, you know, basically most spending was for war, roads, or highways, or items like this that were mutually shared. And in that sense, the Ways and Means Committee really was about tax raising to pay for those public goods. Yeah, yeah. But once our system has gradually happened in the 20th century, it became more and more a system of transfers. Basically the tax writing committees decided, you know what, well, we, we want to be on the gravy side and not just, the, not just the, the takeaway side of the budget or what I call the giveaway side of the budget. And so now you've got this, these two jurisdictions that now complete the tax writing committees and the, uh, the other committees in terms of who gets to give money away and make the public feel good about things. So that has all sorts of implications. It goes well beyond tax expenditures and even some of the things that drive the deficit is nobody wants to be on the takeaway side anymore. Uh, and then I still remember a, a time when I testified, you raised the issue of, of housing and I was making the quick point that housing vouchers might be superior to uh, some tax subsidies for uh, for low-income housing uh, construction. What committee still were you what, what, what committee was means, 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 means the representative Charles Rango. I can't, maybe he may have been chair then. And he leans over the dais and he looks over, he says, Mr. Sterling, when we have jurisdiction over housing vouchers, we can have that discussion. But, but right now, let's talk about what the Ways and Means Committee can deal with. Oh, oh that's, uh, you can't underestimate how, uh, the gloves come off when they're fighting for turf. It's really, ama it's really amazing. Let me, uh, just to set up another uh, item I'd like to have us discuss is, uh, let me ask uh, Tom. Tom, can you tell us why or if the mortgage interest deduction is unfair or an upside down subsidy? Why, if it, and if it is, why is it? Well, I think the goal of the mortgage interest deduction was to try to encourage home ownership. But people who've looked at whether or not it's actually meeting that objective, uh, I think question whether it is successful in terms of increasing home ownership. In fact, it may be just encouraging higher home prices that crowd out first time home buyers and also encourages the use of debt. But many of these tax expenditures, like the mortgage interest deduction and other exemptions and exclusions, uh, are valued based upon the taxpayer's marginal tax rate. And with a right. progressive tax system, that means a $1,000 deduction for charity or for an exclusion of uh, unemployment insurance or for the mortgage interest deduction is worth $370 for the top uh, income taxpayers and perhaps zero or only $120 for, for lower income taxpayers. And so what we oftentimes refer to upside down subsidies where they are regressive and uh, more of the benefit is going to high, high income taxpayers. So, you know, and also with the changes in the 2017 Tax Act increasing the standard deduction, I think about one third of taxpayers were taking the mortgage interest deduction. 
in uh, 2017. That fell into the low teens, yeah. you know, afterwards. And so, you know, is it really uh, achieving its objectives? And I think it's even less likely to now than uh, than before. Does anybody have any ideas on how it might be improved? It's, it's I've, I've, I've written a, an article with Ben Harris, who's now Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy, on why first-time home buyer's credit might make a huge amount of difference. This, of course, is another example where you want to think about spending and tax expenditures almost in the same boat. Uh, it's not clear that a first-time home buyer's credit shouldn't even be in the direct spending budget rather than uh, in the tax expenditure budget. And there's a question of who can even administer it best. Uh, depending on whether you're using mortgage companies and other other intermediaries involved, but uh, a first-time home buyer's credit would really help new homeowners. And we know that the wealth distribution has has not only got dramatically worse, but it's got dramatically worse for young people, who would be the who would be more likely to be the young-time home buyers, uh, home buyers. Uh, on top of that, in terms of thinking about the wealth distribution, which is much worse than the income distribution. Uh, the two major items in the tax code that are the major subsidies for most low and middle income people have to do with homes and retirement accounts. That's where most of us actually accrue most of our saving unless we happen to own businesses or directly own a lot of corporate stock. And so there's huge headway possible in getting at the wealth distribution issues if you tackle those two major areas of tax subsidies, home ownership and retirement. Let me move on to uh, probably be our final topic, which has to do with the tax code and race. Uh, Jai Ching, you've written in 2019 with a co-author, the bulk of tax expenditures likely increase racial disparities and should be overhauled. And Tom, you just wrote a few weeks ago in tax notes, quote, differences in income and wealth inequality can cause uh, facially race-blind tax rules to have dis disparate effects across racial groups. I was wondering if you two could talk a little bit about your work on the tax code and race. Chai Ching, you wanna lead off? Sure, and that piece that you, you mentioned, um, I can't claim to be co-authoring with a current uh, assistant secretary for, for tax policy, but Robert Taylor, you wanna watch out for him, he might be a future one. Uh, terrific co-author on that paper. And one of the, th the examples that we looked at is, is the one that we were just talking about, the, ho the deduction for um, home mortgage interest. And, and this is something that Dorothy Brown and a number of other uh, academics have written about previously. And what they pointed to is that because of uh, a history and, and a present of barriers to full economic opportunity for black people and people of color, you have this income distribution and this wealth distribution where white people are disproportionately and overwhelmingly represented at the top uh, and people of color uh, are more overrepresented at other uh, towards the bottom and the middle of the income distribution. And so that means that income tilt that we were just talking about means that the deduction generally accrues to uh, filers who are higher income and likely disproportionately white. Um, but this research has also pointed out that that's not the end of the story where the, the inequities might layer on, because even among households with similar income, uh, there are barriers that are influenced by racism that mean that Black people and other people of colour may be less likely to be able to buy a home or to access uh, lending or to purchase in an area where the initial investment uh, grows at the same rate as, as, as the white filer who has, has purchased the home with the uh, the benefit of the tax break. Um, Jean also mentioned employer provided savings vehicles. Uh, there's data showing that black people are less likely to have access to those sorts of, of vehicles, even, even when you do control for income and uh, types of employers or employment in a certain industry. Uh, so that's uh, an additional way in which uh, it seems that there's a lot of suggestive evidence that you, you have tax expenditures that are uh, are doubly inequitable in this way, um, although we don't yet know, we don't have yet the hard data that shows that to us because a lot of the way that we do analyses by race uh, really uses income as a proxy for race, so you're missing some of that variation that might be picked up if you were able to do it more directly. No, it's very interesting. Um, um, of course, nobody's claiming that the 
tax code, uh, tax writers are overtly trying to be uh, racist in any way, but um, but they may inadvertently be ca ca causing racial disparities. And I was fascinated to learn uh, about the marriage penalty and how if you have couples with equal incomes, your, um, how does it work? Uh, you're um, more likely to have a marriage penalty than if you have couples with unequal incomes. And it just turns out that in white America, there's more, I guess, of the traditional uh, male being the pr primary bread earner and the female being a, either a lesser earner or a non-earner, while the um, uh, black uh, households might have more equal earnings. And, you know, uh, <laughs> that's just, uh, but that, is a very pronounced demographic trend, and that's a very pronounced tax impact. And so uh, it's it's uh, interesting to uh, learn about these things. Tom, you wrote a great article. Um, what what uh, what do you want to share with us on that? I think there's been increasing concern about the significant income and wealth disparities in the U.S. And in the last you know three years, I think they're now is much more heightened appreciation about the racial disparities that uh, go even beyond the income and wealth disparities. But uh, I think that is an additional reason why uh, government spending through the tax code, i.e. tax expenditures, really should be reviewed uh, much more systematically. And I think with a greater focus on equity considerations. Uh, oftentimes, the, the government spending is, uh, or programs are evaluated based upon efficiency. Uh, and oftentimes, equity gets a short shrift. And I think we now know that even though the tax code is, you know, facially blind in terms of explicit discrimination, there really are uh, significant differences in the amount of government spending through the tax code to go to you know, white versus black versus Hispanic uh, families. In the case of, uh, you know, there 13% of households are black. Uh, and yet, uh, using some aggregate numbers from the JCT and the Census uh, uh, Bureau, you know, I estimate that only 5% of the dividend uh, lower tax rates goes to black households. And you can look at the other large tax expenditures and many of them are based upon, you know, wealth and, you know, high, high income. So I really would uh, like to have more of a systematic review with more emphasis in terms of equity considerations. I, uh, I could add a, add a footnote here. You. Yes, to, to be able to do that type of analysis, I should mention that Lynn Berman and some of my colleagues at the Urban Institute, as well as the Statistics of Income Division IRS, are busy trying to create synthetic data files that would allow that type of analysis without threatening by any privacy concern whatsoever. Well, the, when you say threatening privacy concerns, because I know that uh, some people are saying maybe we should collect uh, race information on tax returns, because then we would have the data to uh, very, you know, not directly assess uh, the distribution across uh, race and ethnicity. But I don't think that's ever going to happen where you have a 1040 where on the top you check off um, what your racial profile is. The synthetic data set would help us avoid that problem. Right, exactly, exactly. But I do think you know, race and ethnicity is collected for many government programs. So if you're evaluating you know, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, uh, housing, uh, programs, that information is collected. And so I think uh, as part of President Biden's you know, executive orders, uh, they are going to have a data uh, task force that includes the Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy uh, to look at whether or not more information should be available to um, address issues of racial disparities. You know, we have a lot of safeguards in terms of privacy uh, mm -hmm. in the income tax code. And so, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, there's privacy violations by putting down, you know, your, uh, your race and ethnicity versus putting down that you're making, uh, you know, $10 million of income, I think, uh, hopefully, 
everybody's protected in that sense. But I, I would say that you know, even if we were able to collect that information on income tax returns in 2021, uh, the efforts by uh, Eugene's colleagues at the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center for imputations and you know, the Joint Committee on Taxation and Treasury doing imputations for non-filers and for things that aren't currently on the income tax return should be pursued uh, so that we can start getting some of this better analysis of racial disparities sooner than you know, 2024, 2025. Yeah, I was, uh, the, I, uh, the Statistics of Income Division of the IRS produces an amazing amount of data, and they produce data by zip code. And uh, uh, many years ago, I wrote an article in Tax Notes uh, uh, comparing some of the poorest zip codes with the wealthiest zip codes, and I came up with a headline-grabbing number of there's a hundred times more per capita benefit how. Uh, housing in the, the wealthy zip code than in the poor zip codes. Mm -hmm. And that's not too hard to believe because as you point out, Tom, if I'm getting $370 for every $1,000 of deduction. And Marty, I live in- Marty, didn't you get in trouble because one zip code was a building in New York and that was <laughs> too, much, too, much, too much identification? That, I, they, they published it. I, I, all I did was uh, transmit it. Oh, it was the, uh, the Helmsley building. Leo, remember her? At any rate, it's, uh, no, it's interesting to look at the zip code data, but yeah, uh, the very wealthy zip codes are very small. So, so by the way, a quicker effort, even than synthetic data files, now these might not be available to the public, is just to allow a lot more income matching across your across uh, uh, departments. And that's something people have been complaining about for 30 years. And that's mainly just a lack of, of a moderate amount of resources in government to allow those matches to take place, as well as, in some cases, the Congress allowing uh, those matches to be done, even with the fact that any data set has some minute privacy issue involved. So income matching or matching of, of, of data sets could go a long way towards dealing with a lot of this as well. Absolutely, and I, I think given given the possibility to do that relatively quickly with a, a moderate amount of resources, Jean said, I think that's the direction I would probably head in, uh, less for the privacy concern and more for the chilling concern. I think there are there is data and information that does suggest that uh, particularly um, Hispanic filers may be uh, among the, those that are least likely to claim the EITC and CTC, but those data are a little bit old. I'm, I'm concerned that given the four years that we've just uh, seen with uh, the sorts of fear in the, in the communities that have uh, high immigrant populations in them, that people would be even less uh, willing to file a tax return and claim tax benefits if they thought that information that they disclosed uh, around their race or ethnicity might be used uh, in ways that that could not be used for. Let's let's be clear that IRS is very very careful about the, the use of its data, but just given that general climate, I do think we need to sort of be aware that there may be some downsides in asking people for additional information that they may consider sensitive and, and not want to give uh, government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like a lot of interesting research is going to take place uh, very soon. Um, Kara, let me kick, oh, I, I do want to mention before we uh, leave the topic, um, the federal government isn't the only one that does tax expenditure analysis. Tom, you mentioned other countries doing tax expenditure analyses, and then also the states have been very active in doing uh, tax expenditure analyses, and apparently, I, I just glancing, I'm not, uh, Kara, actually, you can chime in here, the, uh, uh, they're having, it, they're all over the place in terms of how far they've developed these uh, uh, tax expenditure budgets. They're very hard to do. You have to do the estimates. You have to make judgments about what is and is not included. And of course, it's a political minefield. So people do not like to be identified in, in the tax expenditure budget. But uh, it's, I think we all can agree, as imperfect as any, even the best tax expenditure budget will be, um, it conveys a great deal of useful information that should be more widely available and subject to review. And I think every college economics 
students should, uh, you know, you have 160 students in your class, give each one a tax expenditure and have them do an evaluation of it. I think uh, that would be a step in the right direction. Marty, we've uh, principally talked about income tax expenditures. Right. You mentioned that in the case of uh, the uh, exclusion of employer provided health insurance, the total tax expenditure is much, much larger because of the payroll tax exemption. Yeah. Uh, I think it's real important to uh, perhaps expand the tax expenditure analysis to non-income taxes. And that clearly is very important in non-US countries where value-added value right. yeah. tax exemptions and payroll tax exemptions are, are, are very important. I know the US Treasury has once or twice done a special analysis of a state tax Right. as well as payroll tax, uh, tax expenditures. So I think that is definitely worth uh, uh, pursuing. Well, well you, and I, you and I were involved in, in getting out that estate tax expenditure budget at the very end of the Reagan administration. It soon got dropped a few years later. Uh, the, um, and with um, so much, well, for example, in the uh, CARES Act, you had the ERTC, the Employee Retention Tax Credit, and that was a credit against the payroll tax. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it's a whole other issue whether we should be eating into the uh, payroll taxes and into the trust funds uh, with tax expenditures. But as that increases, uh, that's going to be important. And excise taxes, there have been some real doozy uh, loopholes in there in the uh, alcohol fuels credits and so forth. Um, so yeah, it really needs to be you know, again, it's easy for us to sit here and go, go ahead and do it. It's extremely difficult for a staff that's already overworked. Well, the, the payroll tax expenditure could come up in a big way. And it's really hidden for the most part in, in Social Security reform, which we know is going to have to take place within a decade or so. And maybe the biggest reform that we all face in the next, uh, 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 next 10 years or so. And the payroll tax expenditures are very important to be considered in that light. And as you're talking, Marty, about uh, you know the the limited resources that the Joint Committee on Taxation and and Treasury have to do all of the work, plus uh, potentially analyze tax expenditures. I think this is another reason why we should have more integration between tax expenditures and and other government spending. That uh, with 167 tax expenditures, 1.4 trillion annual. Um, you know, outlays, uh, there really does need to be more analysis of the objectives, who are the beneficiaries, uh, is it successful, uh, the cost benefit analysis. And, you know, instead of doing, you know, all this work every year for just a single number on a tax expenditure, I would almost trade off having them, you know, put out more information every three or five years rather than having them spend time just updating uh, 167 yeah. just pure budget numbers. Well, they're required by statute, I believe, right? But uh, that's a very, nevertheless, that's a, that's a, that's a good point. I, we must mention, speaking of good staff work, the um, Congressional Research Service every two years puts out a wonderful volume reviewing tax expenditures. And they just put one out, I believe, late last year it's over a thousand pages long, mm -hmm. so and uh, but it is a non uh, you know nonpartisan uh, pros and cons and description of all of the tax expenditures and it's uh, it's online and freely available and I, it's it's just an incredible reference uh, for anybody who wants to delve a little bit more into this. Now the Biden administration's uh, infrastructure proposal includes repealing a number of fossil fuel tax expenditures, but also to increase and expand a number of other uh, renewable uh, fuel tax expenditures. It would be very helpful, you know, to have more analysis of uh, both the ones they're proposing to repeal as well as those they're planning on expanding and, uh, and uh, starting new ones. Well, he'll be uh, proposing cuts to capital gains, number, number three on our list, and to uh, 
the 20% deduction for qualified business expenses. So, uh, and then he's going to increase the corporate rate, which would increase the total. So yeah, it's lots going to happen. Uh, and the tax- Although, are, although the, the sort of um, the increasing the minimum tax rate on offshore profits decreases what's treated as a tax expenditure for the lower rates on offshore That's profits, right. which is another piece of uh, sort of big piece of the puzzle. Yeah. I, I, exactly, exactly. I, I think just sort of to, to um, grab onto one of the, the things that you were sort of mentioning in your chart earlier, that, that the total value of these tax expenditures goes up and down with the, the rate. Um, that also means that they have the feature that overall, because they are overall regressive, they are also overall uh, pro-cyclical in a way that yes. seems uh, somewhat relevant now as we come out of a, a recession where they're, uh, you know, that maybe being sort of pro-cyclical may not be the, the sort of thing that you want to be thinking about. So uh, that's another sort of rationale for looking at, at sort of reforming tax expenditures. Um, Absolutely. I think that, that gets overlooked. You want to increase tax, you want to increase stimulus during the recession, economics 101, and tax expenditures uh, uh, don't just work in exactly the opposite direction. So, and, that, and that's why I'm I, just to sort of say something that might be controversial with, with Gene and Tom, although, you know, I, I do think it is uh, a very good thing and the ideal thing to sort of go one by one, because we've said there's such a, a great spread of tax expenditures and, and their goals and how they're performing against these goals. Um, as a second best option, I, I would not at all look, look askance at something like a a limit on the dollar value of tax expenditures at the top or some other across the board way of, uh, you know, making some of the, the sort of more skewed ones less regressive uh, mm -hmm. and potentially less waste, wasteful at the top, even though ideally you would deal with them one by one. Mm -hmm. So although, although I've said, I think each one needs to be examined one by one, I do think, and this gets tricky, but I think we have to separate the issues of efficiency, equity, and administrability. And actually, we haven't even got to the administrability, except Chai Ching, you, 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 you touched on it briefly, but then we moved on. But, but let me get to the first two, the efficiency and the progressivity. I think in terms of efficiency, we need to examine each one directly to see how well it's doing. But also, and this always gets complicated, relative to other alternatives, which yeah. could be direct or indirect. But on progressivity, I think the issue is really confusing. And let, let me give a direct spending analogy because just because it's simple. The education budget, no matter how you design it, is going to be regressive. The main beneficiaries of people who get education are the people who get the most education. They'll be the people who get the most gains from it. They'll make the most income. To me, you solve that problem by creating a progressive rate schedule that says when you earn income, you pay back to society what you get. In fact, I'd even apply that to student loans in, in many cases. I don't think you have to make higher ed progressive, you can have alternative ways of getting the money back. So I think the same thing happens to tax expenditures. So take, take the uh, increase in the standard deduction. That was a progressive movement in a fairly regressive bill, uh, the tax jobs and uh, tax cut and jobs act of, of 2017. But yet it made uh, certain tax expenditures look more regressive. Because now the whole mortgage interest deduction, the charitable deduction was more concentrated at the top. But if you said what would be better to extend those deductions down the income scale or to increase the standard deduction, well, increasing the standard deduction was more progressive. Or I can go to those of you who were involved in the tax reform effort in 84, people come and say, well, we, you know, we can't, we really got a problem with regressivity and getting at this efficiency assistance. Well, no, it's not an issue because when we were designing that, we were going to adjust the rate schedule to hit our ultimate desired progressivity. So any attack on the regressivity of one program got adjusted in the rate schedule and it was offset. So progressivity should, in an ideal sense, be thought of in a more composite way. The bigger the package, the more you can deal with the progressivity issue by designing the right progressive provisions or the adjusting the rate schedule and not debate whether you need to have some inefficient program or you can get rid of it or expand it because it's a regressive or progressive. Uh, I, I just mentioned uh, uh, Bill Gale's uh, words of wisdom, which are, we don't, every provision of the code doesn't have to be progressive, just the entire code has to be, uh, should be progressive. So, Carrie, do we have any uh, questions in the uh, inbox? A, we have actually quite a lot of questions, although oh, you've uh, done a very good job of reading them with your minds and you've answered some as we've gone along. Um, 
So I'm going to kind of start from the bottom and, and we'll work our way up and see how many we can get to. First, and you, you, Jean, you kind of touched on this just a moment ago with, with outlining um, how to evaluate uh, tax expenditures. Do you all have any advice for the Biden administration? Um, the infrastructure plan proposes expanding or introducing uh, nearly a dozen tax expenditures. How would you rate it? And do you have any advice for the administration and how they can be uh, effective in implementing this? That's for Jean. Well, I just I just talked, so I, I'm thinking I was going to defer to my colleagues here. Well, I think the uh, really should be doing an assessment of uh, what the objectives are and are they going to be done in a cost uh, cost effective way and are they the, the best approach to uh, achieving them. And so in the case of some of the renewable uh, fuels credits, there is a push to have, I think it's called the direct uh, payment option so that some of the smaller companies will get an immediate refundability of those credits, similar to what uh, is now with the earned income tax credit and, and the child tax credit. A refundable credit to a, a company that's experiencing cash flow issues is very important in terms of having an effective uh, investment incentive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this one may actually, I'm sorry, go ahead, Chai Go for it, go for it, Carol. So, Tom, this question may actually be for you as well, though anyone is welcome to jump into it. Um, someone asked, uh, thinking about the comparison of global tax expenditures, say, for example, France subsidizes higher education with tax dollars, America gives only a tax credit. How do you compare those tax expenditures between different countries? Well, that's, uh, you're, you want to try to compare apples with apples. And one of the things in terms of doing international comparisons the U.S. is oftentimes viewed as a low-tax, low-spending country. But as you can see with uh, you know, Marty's slides, where tax expenditures account for 41% uh, of total tax revenue, that would boost the U.S. Uh, tax-to-GDP ratio from 25% up to the OECD average of 33 to 34%. So tax expenditures can be, uh, you know, uh, they can really mislead people who look at some of the budget budget numbers. Yeah, I uh, I think our current spending is three point six trillion. So you know, if you throw tax expenditures on there, let's just let's just say it's another trillion. Well, that's four point six trillion. That's a different way, a big difference in the way you look at our uh, our government. This also goes to how people are characterized as taxpayers. I hear oftentimes that, uh, you know, uh, over half the people don't pay any income tax. Well, a lot of that is because of refundable uh, and even non-refundable tax credits. But if those people earn an additional $100 of income, their refundable credit is going to decrease by uh, 12%. So they really are still in the income tax system. They are still income tax payers. We just happen to be running, uh, you know, some of the you know child allowances and work subsidies through the uh, through the tax code. Mm -hmm. I have to say, it's all incredibly fascinating. There's so many. There's so many good questions here, and we have a minute and thirty seconds left. Um, we'll ask one more. We'll go a little bit over time, if that's okay with you guys. Is dynamic scoring used to price tax expenditures? And do you think the costs are accurate? The quick answer is no. Dynamic scoring is not used in the uh, estimates of the foregone revenue. Uh, they are tax expenditure estimates are budget estimates, and they are not revenue estimates of proposed legislation. And so I think they are accurate uh, for the purpose, but uh, they should not be treated as uh, revenue estimates or including expected you know, uh, behavioral effects as a result of a, a repeal or a modification of them. They are, okay. all so estimates are, are that, estimates. They're not perfectly accurate. And these numbers are even, um, require much more interpretation because they're not like revenue estimates. There are There is no behavioral response incorporated into them. So, uh, but 
they still convey a hell of a lot of excellent information. So we don't want to, we do want to be critic, uh, critically evaluate the, the numbers, but we do not want to say, oh, throw the whole thing out because it's not accurate. No, that's that would be wrong. Very few accounting systems, whether for direct spending or tax expenditures, can take into account behavior, except where it's so, so direct you can sort of easily account for it. Well, I can't thank you guys enough. This was an incredibly interesting conversation today. And, uh, and judging by the number of questions that we had, and I think everyone else thought so as well, and I, we could probably go on for another hour, uh, but we will conclude here today. And I thank everyone for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks.